thanks very much to, uh, to Jenny, to Martine, to Frank, uh, to so many people from the Canberra policy community and to the students. I spent a lot of time debating at uh, ANU when I was a, a student at Melbourne University and uh, there are many things I remember and many things I want to forget. But uh, it was always a great joy to be at ANU and to be here at the Crawford School of Public Policy, admittedly in the Curtin School of Medicine, is I think an appropriate place to look at the issues of public policy, to look at the issues of what is it we're actually trying to achieve. So let me begin with a, a confession and also a, an apology. The confession is that uh, it may look like spectacularly uh, clever timing that we're speaking 24 hours after certain events in Europe made this a, a global issue and a national issue. Uh, but really it was built around the fact that Frank was returning from his own events in Europe and so uh, it's more coincidence than, uh, than triumph in the timing. The apology is I've prepared a long speech about four and a half thousand words but the good news is I'm going to speak to it uh, and table it and you can read it at leisure. I understand, uh, Jenny, that it will be provided both in hard and soft copy to the audience. In addressing climate change, let me begin with the important points of what we agree on. And we agree on the science, we agree on the targets, uh, and we agree on the need to use market mechanisms. Where we disagree, though, is on the mechanism and global events make it absolutely clear in my mind and this is my thesis that if you want the public policy outcome of reduced emissions at the lowest cost then you have to have the right mechanism not the wrong mechanism I lived through the, the home insulation program and the green loan schemes which were created with the best of intent but poor design and a failure to understand how humanity and markets work together meant that seemingly simple programs collapsed under their own weight. And so that's why the system matters tremendously. The disagreement is around the use of a carbon tax and electricity prices, primarily because electricity prices being the, the heart of a carbon tax are an essential service. They're a largely inelastic good, not perfectly, but a largely inelastic good. And that the consequence of that is that we can cause an enormous amount of damage without actually achieving the fundamental task of decreasing our emissions, and certainly without doing it at the lowest direct cost. So against that background, what I want to do is proceed in three ways. One, to look at the genuine international context. Two, to look at some of the brief flaws in the carbon tax. I've discussed that at length elsewhere and I don't want to dwell on that this evening. And three, to look in detail at the essence of the Emissions Reduction Fund. Uh, in particular, the notion of how it works, what's the budget. Beyond that, to, uh, to go to what are the structures and then what's the, the final set of consultation. Um, I also acknowledge Professor Stephen Howes, who was uh, with me at the great University of Melbourne. Uh, he has crossed the line, but uh, I'll forgive him that. Uh, and uh, he was a great humanitarian then, uh, not that things have changed since. Uh, and taught me a lot at the time in student work about uh, caring and the way in which he uh, made a life's work out of his passion at university. So let me go forwards from, uh, uh, from here and begin with the international context. And I think it is absolutely essential because anything we do occurs against two critical notions. Firstly, that the Productivity Commission said that no other country has an economy-wide carbon tax or emissions trading scheme like Australia. For all of the different discussions, the definitive statement <coughs> was the Australian Productivity Commission. The second thing is to understand the consequences of a policy which isn't framed against that international environment. And in particular, there is the risk of carbon leakage, of sending jobs and emissions offshore to China or India or to Indonesia or to the United States in a way in which not only does it not reduce emissions, but in fact the global footprint can increase. 
The simplest example being uh, Penrice Soda, uh, which uh, makes, uh, amongst other things, soda ash. It closed down its Australian operations uh, recently for soda ash and said they would import from the United States. Because of the transport uh, footprint, the net impact was that global, uh, global emissions are likely to increase as a consequence of that decision. It's a completely perverse outcome which nobody would have wanted, but it was, I believe, an inevitable outcome. So let's then look around the world. I want to look at China and India, to look at the United States and Canada and Japan, and then to look at the EU system briefly. In China, what we see is a, a passage according to Professor Garno's um, uh, third report uh, the, of China going from 5 billion tonnes of emissions in 2005 up to 12 billion tonnes of emissions a year by 2020. So for all of the discussion, the reality of emissions in China is that it is going through the greatest growth in emissions in global history. And that's because it's involved in a grand historic project of bringing a billion plus people out of poverty. That is something that we've all believed in, bringing people out of poverty. But there is this inevitable trajectory with which we have to, to deal and contend. The second point about China is that uh, from time to time the Prime Minister may discuss uh, the fact that uh, s some small Chinese coal-fired power stations are closing. That is absolutely true. But larger coal-fired power stations are opening in greater numbers. The uh, simple example I want to give is Zilingol. Zilingol is uh, one of a dozen uh, prefectures in Inner Mongolia. It's one of 33, which itself is one of 33 provinces in China. The Zilingol, according to China Daily, as part of its uh, current five-year plan, is putting in place 24 new coal mines and eight coal-fired power station clusters. And that's for a population of one million. Its goal is to be a mass energy exporter throughout China. And so that leads, not surprisingly, to the, the fact that Chinese coal consumption is going from 1.4 billion tonnes in 2002 to 4 billion tonnes, where we had thought it was going to stabilise in 2015. But only last year, Minister Wu Yin made the statement that that would then continue to 7.5 billion tonnes of coal consumption a year by 2030. So those are staggering figures. And this isn't to be pessimistic, it's not to be defeatist, but it is to recognise the real world we, uh, in which we inhabit. So we, we then go to India, and India is going through a period of dramatic growth itself in its industrialisation, in its process of electrification and bringing people out of poverty. Frank's work, which I've cited in the paper, shows an increase uh, between 2005 and, uh, and 2020 of between 75 to 94% in Indian emissions. Sometimes the government may say, but India is, has a carbon tax of sorts. It actually has a coal royalties tax of a dollar per tonne, which compares with a long-running Queensland tax of approximately $20 a tonne. It is a minor revenue raising mechanism. What is happening though in both countries is productive genuine work on energy efficiency. But it's slowing the trajectory of growth. It's slowing the rate of growth. It's not as some would have us believe in some way seeing a reduction in emissions. We are going through the greatest growth in human emissions in human history. Uh, we then go on to the United States and uh, the Republicans said uh, immediately uh, uh, just, over, well, just over 18 months ago that uh, according to uh, Jim Sensenbrenner from the, uh, uh, the House that any form of national carbon tax in the United States is dead. Much more significantly, on at least three occasions since the presidential election, the White House has said they will not be proposing uh, a national carbon tax for the United States. In the State of the Union address, the President raised the topic, addressed the topic, and then effectively conceded that it wasn't going to happen and turned to energy efficiency mechanisms that can directly reduce emissions. In Canada, there was an election which had many similarities to the current one we're facing, which was built around the issue of electricity prices and tax, and the Canadians overwhelmingly rejected. 
rejected it. In Japan, what we've seen is that uh, the Japanese have deferred any form of carbon tax, and only this week, uh, and I've learnt this even since we prepared the written version of the paper, uh, only this week the Japanese have put forward a proposal for a credit scheme or abatement scheme with remarkable similarities to exactly the thing that the coalition is proposing in Australia. So instead of a tax, they are proposing an incentives-based credit scheme. Uh, that is brand new, brand new news, which is uh, literally something discovered in the last 24 hours and announced this week in Japan. So we then go forward to the EU. Many of you will say, well, the EU has a, an emissions trading scheme. And yes, it does. Uh, but the difference here is uh, twofold. In its first five years, on the work of the Minerals Council, the EU scheme had approximately uh, five, a total value of $500 million a year on average. The population of the EU is 500 million, so about a dollar per person per year. The Australian scheme, which is $9 billion uh, all up on an annual basis, uh, is uh, across a population that's uh, just about to hit 23 million. That makes it nearly $400 per person per year. So a, a single dollar versus $400 in terms of the combination of price, but in particular coverage and scope. That is the hidden difference. So other people may call something the same, same thing, but it is a not just dramatically different, but radically different concept. It's the difference between a bowling ball and a, and a pea, in a sense. Uh, and what we've seen in the last uh, 48 hours is the European price collapse. Uh, it uh, dropped uh, yesterday to about $4 Australian. I checked it just before coming here. It's now about $3.50, $3.55 Australian. And so the Australian carbon tax is 600% higher at $3.55, to $23 than the European version. So that all puts these things in context. Uh, now, what do I think is going to happen and should happen at the global level? We want a global agreement. I don't think it's going to be delivered primarily through the uh, UN FCCC process. We should participate in that. But I do think that the real work that Australia can do, and we will be chair of the G20 by the end of this year, it doesn't matter who wins the election in Australia, as a nation, we will be chair of the G20 process. We should aim to broker an agreement or to lay the foundations for an agreement between the G4 in the climate space. China and the United States, backed by India and the EU. That is the heart of any global agreement going forward. And that can be brought in through the G4, and then to create uh, a G20 agreement, we can make real and genuine progress. The second thing that I think we can do internationally is to work on sectoral agreements. And that is where there's a common approach on steel, a common approach on aluminium, a common approach on cement. Instead of one country having one set of standards and impairing itself and inevitably having pushback. That's a, that is the best way, in my judgment, to make real progress over the coming half decade. So having looked at that uh, and making the comment that much of the contemporary domestic policy is framed against an imagination and a fabrication of what's actually happening in the international community, let me look briefly at the carbon tax. There's been lots of discussion about that and then at uh, the Direct Action Emissions Reduction Fund. So the carbon tax itself has, in my judgment, three major flaws. The first and most important of which is it doesn't do the job, it doesn't achieve the emissions reduction which it's intended to do. According to Treasury's figures, between 2010 and 2020, Australia's domestic emissions will climb from 560 to 637 million tonnes. Not much else matters because of all of the things that we talk about, the goal, the public policy purpose of a carbon tax or any other uh, scheme in relation to emissions is to reduce emissions and that doesn't happen under the carbon tax. Uh, and the reason why is very simple. It operates as an electricity tax and electricity is not a perfectly but it is essentially uh, 
an inelastic good. Yeah. In human terms, it's an essential service. It's fundamental to what we do. Uh, in economic terms, as Frank will tell you, it's largely an inelastic good. The work from the United States is that for every 10%, increase over the last 30 years in the price of electricity, there's about a 2.5% decrease. The work of IPART in New South Wales uh, has shown that for whatever particular set of circumstances in Australia, a 50% increase in electricity prices has led to a 6% consumption impact. So in other words, it involves an enormous amount of pain to achieve a very modest outcome. Uh, the next thing that uh, uh, I want to say is that, of course, it has an impact on the cost of living for families and, in particular, for jobs. So when you look at the cost of living, that's a, a, a family impact of uh, a net uh, outcome of about $515 uh, per year, according, according to the government's modelling. Uh, but more significantly still, there's a huge impact on the, compa uh, the competitiveness of Australian ind industry with no environmental effect. Because if you are simply sending jobs and emissions offshore, what's happening there with Borrell, with Penrice, with Amcor, uh, is that we are shifting the emissions and if they're going to a higher, a higher emissions regime, that's not helping the planet. And if we are re-importing the goods, that isn't good for the planet either because of the transport footprint involved. And so we lose jobs in a real way uh, at the same time as we don't achieve our outcomes. And so all of that leads to the last element, which is the fact that in addition to the carbon tax, according to the government's estimates, not ours, according to the government's estimates, we'll have to import 100 million tonnes of foreign carbon credits a year, whether it's from China or India or Kazakhstan by 2020. And uh, in doing that, again using the government's current estimates of a $37 per tonne price by 2020 for doing that, that's a $3.7 billion expenditure per year, which rises to a $57 billion expenditure per year using the government's own figures by 2050. That's the equivalent of spending the defence budget simply on purchasing paper from overseas. So let me then move away from the flaws of the tax to what we're proposing. So we have a, an emissions reduction fund as the heart of the direct action scheme. Now, the element of that, or the essence of that, is really the questions of how does it work? What are the budgetary implications? Uh, what are the mechanisms to support it and how do we engage with the community over it? Let me go to the, the first of those. This is a classic market mechanism. So we are creating a reverse auction. That's the way that water is purchased in Australia. The government had a choice. It could either double the price of water to try to dampen demand or it could use water buybacks. Uh, we create a carbon buyback, or in economic terms, a reverse auction. And so you say, well, what does this actually mean? We'll call for the lowest cost forms of emission reduction in Australia, whether it is waste coal mine gas cleanup, whether it's waste landfill gas cleanup, whether it is cleaning up Victoria's brown coal power stations, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's land sector abatement in the form of more vegetation, uh, reforestation, avoided deforestation or soil carbon. Whatever is the lowest cost form of emissions reduction, that's what we will do. In, in economic terms, we simply buy up the cost curve. In terms of prudence, what's really important is this, that in the same way that if you are in the market to buy a million tonnes of wheat, you'll contract uh, with the, uh, the farming community, you'll buy the lowest cost wheat, the farmer can then go and plant, he or she will plant the, uh, plant the wheat knowing that they've got a contract for delivery, but you don't have to pay until you get the wheat. That's exactly what we do with the Emissions Reduction Fund. That uh, we'll do a forward contract, um, we'll buy the lowest cost, and we'll have the certainty that you don't have to pay unless you get delivery, but people can proceed with projects. And we're willing to do long-term commitments uh, so we can have multiple-year purchasing. 
what does it mean in practice? It means that we can simply focus on cleaning up the waste coal mine gas, cleaning up the landfill gas, capturing carbon in reforestation or soil or revegetation, cleaning up the power stations, whatever's the cheapest way, every dollar gets spent on actually purchasing abatement. And that's why you can do this much more cheaply. Because instead of a $9 billion system, um, you, you can do it, and this brings me to the second thing, in a way which is costed and capped. So our, our system is capped expenditure. Many of you may work in the public service, you know absolutely the difference between a demand-driven project uh, program and a capped program. Ours is a capped program, and that means we'll expend 300 million, 500 million and 750 million dollars in each of the the first three years respectively. And that is a significantly less amount, lesser amount than a nine billion dollar a year or 27 billion dollar tax over that over that same period of time. So we control the costs. It's not difficult to do. Most projects are capped. Uh, most programs are capped. That's the way that prudent governments should operate. So you then say, well, how do you actually implement this? There's a number of changes we're going to make, but there are critical elements of infrastructure we're going to keep. We're going to move, obviously, to abolish the carbon tax. We'll start on day one. Uh, we'll proceed in week one of Parliament. Uh, and my view is that uh, it will be gone within six months. You don't have to agree or disagree with that, but my job is to set out the policy. Uh, and on that front, my prediction and my expectation is that if we were successful at the next election, the ALP, under a new leader, in a new circumstance, would have exactly the same experience as we had in relation to work choices. We learnt that uh, the public said no, and they gave that, to, that message to us very clearly at the 2007 election. If that is the outcome of the next election, I think that the ALP will also do what we did and step aside in the Senate and not oppose the repeal of the carbon tax. We will make the question very specific to the carbon tax. There are other elements that we will remove and we've been very upfront about that in terms of uh, the Climate Change Authority, the Energy Security Fund, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the, and the uh, Climate Commission. But I would note amongst that that the climate, uh, the energy security fund gives five and a half billion dollars to Victoria's brown coal power stations plus one or two others around the country to keep producing a brown coal generation of electricity. So rather than being a tax on those, which is passed through in electricity prices, it is the biggest single transfer of public funds in Australian history to any corporate sector, and it is occurring uh, in, under the carbon tax to the brown coal generation sector in, a, in Victoria. Go figure. Um, the next thing is that uh, uh, what we will do is keep three pieces of existing architecture and build our emissions reduction fund around that. The first uh, is uh, the Carbon Farming Initiative. I think that is a great initiative. Uh, we proposed it, uh, we were delighted when it was adopted by the government, and the Carbon Farming Initiative can be expanded uh, to allow 25-year options rather than 100, and to bring in all other forms of emissions reduction. Why are we excluding energy efficiency, cleaning up power stations, waste coal mine gas? Why are we ex excluding uh, transport savings? Whatever is the lowest cost form of emissions reduction. And we can do this in a rapid way by bringing in uh, systems from around the world. The UN Clean Development Mechanism, the gold standard in, uh, in carbon abatement, they can both be brought into the Australian system and uh, applied after being properly tested. The second mechanism we rely, uh, we'll, we'll use is the Clean Energy Regulator. They are doing an excellent job. Um, they are the successor to the Office of Renewable Energy Regulator, which we created, and they have a very important role. At present, they register organisations, they recognise projects, and at the end of each year they issue units to say that abatement has been delivered. Nothing will change. They will have exactly that role, exactly that function. We don't have to change their, uh, their primary mandate. Uh, we just have to make sure that it is focused on expanding the carbon farming initiative out.
And so when you have a good body, which, does, which is operating well, we should be keeping it. Uh, the next step forward from there uh, is that we'll use the National Greenhouse and uh, uh, Energy Reporting Scheme, so the ENGAS, uh, the ENGAS scheme. And with ENGAS, what we're doing there is uh, working towards a single assessment scheme, a single measurement scheme for Australia. So as a consequence of that, um, we're using existing architecture. The last thing is, um, with all of the detail in place, with the policy which has been on the table for three years, we'll still go through consultation post-election. Uh, my belief and intention is to have our scheme up and running by the 1st of July 2014, the election is September 14. We'll then go into an immediate white paper process after the election. We'll call for submissions after 30 days. Uh, we'll consult between days 60 and 100, put out draft, uh, draft legislation and then put out final legislation after more consultation at 150 days. Uh, what that means is that we're already engaging with uh, the environmental and conservation community, with the traders, with the people involved in industry and business, but there's an, an opportunity to look at some of the granular issues around baselines and also around uh, auctioning post-election. So when I step back, the message is this. Uh, the big picture around the world is that the European scheme is not working. It's not uh, reducing emissions only today. Uh, point Carbon, uh, the head of trading for Europe said that they are not expecting the European scheme to reduce one tonne of emissions between now and 2020. And if you care about the planet, you say, hang on, that's not right. We wanted to actually do something here. The Australian scheme isn't, not, isn't reducing emissions in Australia. Emissions go up, not down. And so when you look at that global context and you see what Japan has just said, this idea of incentives, not penalties, of not focusing on an electricity tax, but focusing on directly reducing emissions with real envir environmental benefits is what we're proposing. Uh, I'd be delighted to take any questions, but only after Frank and Martin have had their say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our next speaker is Frank Jotso, and as I mentioned, Director of the Centre for Climate, Economics and Policy. Um, Frank works, has worked on climate policy and carbon markets since the late 1990s, including as advisor to the Garneau Review, and he is a lead author of the fifth assessment report of, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Greg. It's, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to have you here and we're not taking it for granted either because we know it's a special time to be a uh, shadow minister leading up to an election and not at all um, uh, taking for granted that, that you're actually coming here to, to discuss policy. So at the Crawford School what we are trying to do of course is to uh, bring research findings into the policy arena and facilitating an informed policy debate and I'm confident that, that we're ach achieving that tonight as well, uh, including in, in the Q&A uh, later on. Now, First of all, uh, let me say something about the, the future prospects of, of carbon pricing globally as I would see them. Um, uh, I think from an economics perspective, um, there's really no two ways about it. Carbon pricing by way of a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme um, is quite un unambiguously the most cost effective way of reducing emissions in most parts of, of an economy. Uh, it does have some additional advantages as, as some governments see them. Uh, it does create budgetary revenue uh, allowing redistribution um, in terms of the, the costs. Um, and giving a straightforward way uh, to, uh, to exclude uh, low income earners from uh, sharing in the burden of overall mitigation costs. Um, in my view, we, we are um, in for carbon pricing as, as the long term principal mechanism uh, for climate change uh, mitigation uh, action. Now that, that may seem a courageous forecast in, the, in the, the face of the kind of European market meltdown that, that we're just seeing. Um, and just, uh, just a sort of a brief primer for anyone who hasn't 
followed this or read up about it. What, what has happened in, in the EU? Well, uh, the EU emissions target for 2020 looks decidedly weak uh, in the face of economic developments. Essentially, economic recession across much of Europe uh, has done uh, the work for them in terms of uh, reducing emissions growth and, in fact, reducing absolute emission levels. Um, there is a question of a uh, European policymakers increasing ambition of the scheme and the vote in the European Parliament has uh, cast a very long shadow of doubt over the resolve uh, to, uh, to increase ambition in that scheme and that's what we're seeing in uh, reflected now in very, very low uh, market prices. On the other hand, I would say in Australia, thankfully, uh, we're seeing a very different situation that is one of continued, relatively strong economic growth, uh, continued expansion, including in resource and energy intensive industries. So if we're looking for a carbon price to do the work in terms of dampening emissions growth, then that price will have to be at a much higher level than what we're seeing uh, out of Europe. Um, internationally, uh, thanks very much for the, for the reference to the paper by David Stern and myself on India. Uh, true, future emissions growth is expected to come from India uh, and other countries that are at quite low levels uh, of economic um, uh, income and in fact at quite low levels of per capita emissions. India is well below one-tenth of Australia's per capita emissions at this current point in time. Um, but China, the picture is really quite different. We see uh, Chinese emissions growth rates uh, tailing off. We're seeing a rapid shift in economic structure towards more highly value added industries, uh, a very deliberate attempt by the Chinese government uh, to go into, into cleaner uh, industries uh, and indeed to cap coal use. Uh, so uh, I for one would be extremely surprised if we did see at any point in the future Chinese coal consumption to get up to the kinds of levels that some predictions have them at, at like seven billion tons a year or more. Um, China, of course, about to introduce uh, pilot schemes for emissions trading, uh, seven of them. The first uh, few are expected to come online this year. Um, and these pilot schemes alone, in terms of the emissions volumes, will be much larger uh, than Australia's total emissions. Uh, the areas that are introducing pilot schemes encompass over 250 million people. So um, we're also hearing a uh, quite strong um, political commitment from the Chinese leadership to using carbon pricing for future uh, national scale. Uh, carbon taxes indeed might be becoming uh, more attractive. Uh, the discussion that we're hearing out of the US is very much focused uh, on tax reform uh, and, and uh, a tax on carbon emissions as a potential revenue source uh, and possibly displacing other uh, sources of state revenue that may uh, be more distortive than, than a carbon, carbon tax uh, would be. Um, on costs and revenue, um, I mean, there's a strong emphasis, I guess, uh, in, in, in what we've heard uh, from uh, Shadow Minister Hunt um, on, uh, on not raising revenue from, um, from this, uh, this policy. Um, but when we're thinking about brown coal, for instance, what, what we need to keep in mind is that these brown coal fired generators, of course, need to pay the tar carbon tax first, or they need to buy permits for the remainder of the emissions. So it's not just a transfer to them. Uh, it's also a transfer from them to government and then uh, partly uh, they're getting part of their, their emissions for free uh, in the end. In my view, actually, the, the future of carbon pricing does lie in revenue raising uh, models. Um, I think that uh, if and when governments actually embrace pollution taxes as a form uh, to, to create sustainable revenue uh, that, uh, that we will uh, stop seeing these kinds of wild fluctuations uh, in policies and indeed prices that we're observing in the EU at the moment. Um, in terms of direct action, I mean, one important point that we've seen uh, in, uh, in, in survey work and focus group work over the last year or so is that the Australian public is confused about climate change policy, about climate change policy instruments, and very few people out there, very few voters, in fact, understand how a price on carbon might possibly result uh, in, in reduction uh, in emissions. Um, and I guess from that point of view, um, anything that, that creates a visible uh, effect in climate change mitigation is a very attractive thing to do. Um, 
On the other hand, from, from an economic point of view, I guess there's, there's many questions uh, that, uh, that, that raise. Um, I guess uh, from what we're hearing, and indeed from, from what you've said tonight, um, uh, we're looking essentially at a baseline and credit scheme uh, with an expanded carbon farming initiative with new methodologies covering new sectors such as energy efficiency, industrial installations and so forth. Now, there is a precedent for that internationally, and that is the clean development mechanism uh, that gets some uh, mitigation action happening in developing countries under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the experience from there is that uh, it tends to create a large bureaucracy. Um, and so one very interesting question for me is how you will avoid the, the, the bureaucracy uh, kind of mushrooming on that, on that front. Um, it's also very difficult there to get the balance right between being really tight on, on issuing credits and thereby being as sure as you can that you're actually only crediting projects that provide actual reduction in emissions because you're risking to choke off the supply um, and, and, and actually choke off viable projects uh, that, uh, that might reduce emissions. And on the other hand, being quite loose and easy with the accreditation, not being too concerned about additionality of projects, uh, which will get you more projects in the pipeline, but which uh, will invariably lead to some of the claimed emission reductions, not actually leading to emission reductions uh, in aggregate and, and not being reflected in uh, national decreases uh, in emissions. Um, domestic leakage also an issue because with a baseline credit scheme you can of course not be sure um, that the project that you're supporting, that you're subsidizing, uh, will not be offset or partly offset through rises in emissions elsewhere uh, in an activity that's not covered by a project. Um, so in that sense the, uh, the direct action uh, policy to me doesn't sound quite like the water buyback scheme because in the water buyback scheme, I guess, uh, we do have an absolute cap uh, on the amount of water licenses and government going into that market and buying back licenses actually uh, reduces supply uh, of those licenses overall. I'm probably starting to take up too much time um, and so I'll um, Maybe we can come back to some of the points on my list. Um, the, the most important thing that I want to that I want to to, to, to ask a question about is the long term. Um, so, you know, when we think about climate change mitigation, it's really a, uh, an issue for several decades. Okay, it's not so much about next year or the year after. Uh, it's about uh, steering investment decisions, uh, about long-lived investment goods that that are there for several decades, and about creating expectations uh, for policy settings. Uh, way down the track. Um, and so the hope has always been that carbon pricing and emissions trading will provide that, a stable long-term expectation uh, of a carbon price. Um, and I'm really genuinely interested, what is the plan for uh, direct action in years to come? Uh, is the plan to keep the baseline credit scheme going uh, for three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Or is there something uh, that, that is, to, is to follow that, uh, uh, that, that policy uh, down the track? So I'll leave it there. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session. Uh, and <laughs> thank you very much again for being with us. He's also Chair of Law Carbon Australia, a board member of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and an Right. Thank you very much and thank you Frank for inviting me today and, and I think as Frank said, Greg, thanks for taking time out because it is a very busy time for you. Um, Frank has given me 10 minutes just to add a few more comments on what um, has been said today. So I guess I just want to make a couple of comments and some observations based on what we in our experience are seeing currently in the Australian, um, in, in the Australian marketplace. Um, first of all, I think it is important to remember, as, as Greg started off by saying, is that we do have a bipartisan approach to achieving a 5% reduction by 2020. There are many people who argue that's, that, that's nowhere near enough, we need a much higher target than that, but that, that will be an ongoing policy debate uh, regardless of, of, of the politics. Um, 
there's also many different policy approaches to which you can get to that target. And I think, um, you know, as, as both Greg and Frank have, have talked about, the, the, there are different models that have been proposed. And just to run through it, um, you know, the government today has, has put in place an emissions trading scheme. And despite what everybody says, it is an emissions trading scheme. It's not a tax. It has a short-term fixed price that within two years, two years' time will be gone, and that price will be linked to the European price in effect. So I, mean, I think it's important to be aware of that. Previously, the Howard government proposed before, before the election before last an emissions trading scheme. The New South Wales government pursued a baseline and credit scheme. Um, in South Africa, they are talking about a carbon tax. Um, and in other countries, they have other measures. And they may not be either a tax or a scheme. They may be a whole bunch of, of of, um, of ancillary measures, whether they be uh, energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy tariffs, etc. So there's no monopoly on what is the best approach, um, and there's not necessarily a correct approach. It really involves working out what is best for the economy um, in which you're imposing that. And what we're seeing at the moment is, is a range of different measures emerge. Um, Greg has articulated tonight the case and will continue to pro prosecute the case for what is um, the coalition's alternative scheme. And really what direction we ultimately go does very much depend on the election outcome, which is really st stating the obvious. Um, just to make some observations then. First of all, um, when we look around the world today, the, the, fa the fact of the matter is that the dominant approach to dealing with this in terms of tax ETS is in fact an emissions trading scheme. I take Greg's point that many of these are not economy-wide, and that is absolutely correct. Many of these are partial or, or narrow. But when we just look at what some of those schemes are, the Europeans, um, as we've been discussing, do have an emissions trading scheme. And, and it is the case that the price has collapsed at the moment, but it is a complex market, and measures are being looked at to do that. Um, China is developing uh, five to six regional emissions trading schemes with a view to have a national emissions trading scheme. And just to bear in mind, one Chinese province is 200 million people. So when you compare that to the size of the Australian ETS, it's relatively small. In New Zealand, we have a scheme. In California, they have a scheme and that economy is larger than Australia's. South Korea have a scheme. Chile are looking at a very narrow scheme for the electricity sector. Mexico have passed legislation. Costa Rica are working on, on, on legislation. So we do see th the dominant measure at the moment being an emissions trading scheme. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. It's just an observation that it is the route people are going. Um, the, the second observation I want to make is that this is very much a long-term problem and it requires a long-term policy objective. So it is very difficult to make sort of judgments about what's going on at any particular point in time because things move all the time. And we talk about pricing. If, if I knew what pricing was going to do in emissions trading schemes, I'd be a, a trader, not a, not a lawyer. But it's interesting that we've got people who tell us that within the next two to three years, the European price will crash further. We've got Bloomberg, who uh, the month before last was saying that by 2016, 16, 17, the price could be 50 euro. It's really, really difficult to know um, where these are going because they're markets, and like any other commodity market, they're, they're, they're volatile. And what makes it even more difficult in carbon markets is the very fact that these are markets created by law. And if you have a slight change in the law, it does affect the price significantly. In terms then of, of, of what we're seeing in the market, most Australian companies, I think despite what people say, are, are very resilient and are very uh, adaptable. And I think with the introduction of the emissions trading scheme here, most companies ha have got ready for that scheme. They, they are meeting their obligations and they're ready to move under the carbon price mechanism. Um, in our experience, um, and Greg may have had different experience, there's no evidence that companies have been driven offshore as a result of the carbon price. There are other factors, economic factors at play, but we personally have not seen that. Um, but the political uncertainty that exists at the moment in Australia around the different policy approaches certainly means that, that business is very hesitant to work out um, where to go beyond the immediate compliance period. There is no doubt that um, in the moment, if you wanted to have the lowest cost of abatement and you were looking longer term, you would go and buy European Union allow allowances, particularly with the price being as low as it is, or you'd go and buy C uh, CDM credits, given that they're down at the moment at around 40 cents. So it is, it, it, there is a real incentive to do that, but because of the fact of the uncertainty that exists, 
people are not prepared to do long-term offtake agreements for that carbon in the event that the scheme um, may change in the future. So what we're seeing, we think at the moment, is there are, there are a suite of companies who believe that, that they do not want change, they want the carbon price to stay, and we've seen um, Australian industry groups say that. There are also a suite of companies who do want the carbon price to go and, and do not want to keep the current mechanism. And so what matters most for a lot of these companies is political certainty. So what they want to know is exactly what the policy will be, what the transition will be, and part of what Greg is doing is articulating that process of change. Um, I think uh, another point to make also is that um, in terms of, of, of what's coming, what could potentially come next if there is a change in government, then there are a, a range of sort of issues that we get asked about about the different policies, and some of them actually Greg has articulated quite well tonight. Well, one is on the direct a action fund. The direct a action fund is ultimately public money; it's taxpayers' money being used to buy carbon, but. If Greg has got the economics right, then what we're saying is actually the cost of that to the public is less than the cost of the carbon pass-through with a higher carbon price. That's a debate that will have to be seen as to how the pricing works out. Um, to get abatement under the direct action plan, and Greg clarified this tonight, you do have to have long-term off-take agreements. So if you want to build a project and you want to get that project financed and you want to borrow money, you need to be able to demonstrate um, that you will have a long-term off-take agreement with the government, I'd say at least six years plus, and you have a carbon price within that contract sufficient to fund uh, the project cost. And I think Greg's made it clear tonight that the intention is to have long-term offtake contracts there. Um, and I think that, in our view, we think there is quite a lot of low-hanging fruit and the price can be quite low in a lot of the energy efficiency areas. But over time, that price will, for a lot of other areas, you know, you're looking in forestry and other areas at a minimum of $12 up, um, depending on, on where that goes. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit still to be done. And our experience with low-carbon Australia is that there's a significant amount of energy efficiency to be taken out of the economy, um, and, and, and there is a lot more, a lot more opportunity to do a lot more energy efficiency, um, particularly in the built environment sector. Um, there's also uh, uh, the, the issue which we often hear from industry about, you know, um, making sure that that, that, that with with the direct action plan being more of a voluntary plan that, that action is taken up. And I guess so to Greg, I'll say to you, one of the things is that we often hear, well, with GGAP, there wasn't necessarily um, the uptake. So they'll be having enough incentive. I think the idea of having long-term uptake contracts is very important because it does allow you to get the ability to finance projects. Um, the other comment I'll make is that we also, in context of baseline and credit, I think there's some confusion out there. Um, I mean, the baseline credit scheme is very well known. I mean, New South Wales had that scheme and it's quite clear. So one of the things, there's been discussion about whether or not um, there will be penalties. So if you're over your baseline, do you get penalised? And if you're under, do you get credit? Now it's clear that you get credit, but there's a bit of confusion, I think, in the marketplace about whether or not you get penalised if you're over or under. And so I think um, uh, what, and again, without having too much detail on that, a lot of the debate that will that, that, that will come around a baseline and credit scheme is where do you set the baseline? I know, Greg, you've articulated that, but industry will have a different view on what their baseline will be. And there'll be plenty of players who will probably, you know, in the same way that they sought to have a good allocation of free permits, they'll seek mm. to have a very low baseline mm. um, applicable to their, to, 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 to their arrangement. So whatever scheme you go down, um, there are always these complicated issues about dealing with industry, and there are always challenges for governments in dealing with industry when industry controls the facts and figures of their pollutants and government has to try to work within those parameters, so it is a challenge. Um, I think the final comment I want to make is that, is that in our experience, a lot of the comments around the impact of the ETS um, in Australia are probably over-exaggerated. We think that, that whether it's this program or any other program, Australian companies are very good at, at, at working out what legislation is, working out how to comply with that legislation and then working through it. And as I said, what people don't really like in legislation is political uncertainty and a lot of change. So managing that process is, is very important. Um, I think also, as a final comment, the policy itself has to be broad, it has to be pretty comprehensive, and it has to be mandatory. Uh, as much as we like, might, might like to say, at the end of the day, you need to have businesses required to reduce pollution. I don't personally think that incentives are enough. I think the Carbon Farming Initiative is excellent, and I think that a direct action fund to buy that is excellent, but I think that at the end of the day, you need to have industry being required to reduce their pollution, because history has shown with other environmental legislation that simply doesn't happen. So I'll end on that note. Those are just a few observations and sort of builds on what Frank has said and, and Greg. Thank you.
Martijn, that was, that was terrific. Um, I think what I'd like to do now is to give uh, Greg a couple of minutes to respond to specific points that have been raised by the previous two speakers, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much uh, to Jenny again. Look, I'll be very, very brief because we want to really get into the Q&A. I, I really want to just address three, three, three things briefly. The first of which is this notion of, is it having an impact on firms? I can give a, an academic answer, but I'll give something very different. This morning I was at Aladala, and it was a long drive. Uh, and I met with the owner of an IGA, and I met with the owner of a milk bar. And we were talking about the impact of recent electricity price rises. So this year in New South Wales, on average, it's a 15% price rise. Uh, in the small business sector, because they've had lower average tariffs, it's sometimes uh, up to 20%, but the carbon tax component, on average, for small and medium business is about 14.5%, according to the Australian Industry Group. And I said, how, how have you dealt with that? And they said, oh, very simple. Um, the owner of the milk bar uh, and fish and chip shop said, I've cut, the, uh, I've cut one place from my milk bar for a, uh, uh, sorry to say, you know, a young girl uh, who was working here. Um, I'm not going to have that part-time work. I'm getting in now at 5.30 uh, and I'm working later. The owner of the IGA said, same deal. Uh, I've uh, held off on hiring somebody I would have hired. Um, I'm really struggling with the electricity price. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, I'm not hiring somebody that I would have hired and I'm having to get in uh, earlier and work a little bit longer to fill the gap. That's the real world uh, of what's happening. And whether it's Penrice, Borrell, Amcor, uh, whether it's uh, Tomago or many other producers in a manufacturing sector which is being absolutely shattered by a high Australian dollar, you add in those electricity costs, you add in the uh, costs of production and it pushes a lot of them right to the edge. That's, that's my view. Then, then there are uh, two brief technical questions. Frank talked about um, uh, the carbon price and I think there's a bit of confusion. Um, it, I'm not uh, saying necessarily with Frank, of course. Uh, but I think there's a bit of confusion between the issue of the price of carbon and the price of abatement. The thing that really matters is the price for reducing emissions. It doesn't matter what the price is for emitting if it doesn't actually reduce. Uh, and so you see that a carbon tax in Australia, for example, taxes around about 350 million tonnes a year. Um, but its real job is to provide a de uh, is to have a decrease. Uh, and I'll just draw a, a, a chart. If this works, does that work? I'm getting some technical advice. Thank you. Uh, it's a university. I couldn't resist. Um, so you see that this is. Uh, millions of tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum. You can see why I wasn't a university lecturer. Um, and we go from 560 in 2010 up to 2020, where our projection is up 692 million tonnes. Our agreed task is to get to 537. The carbon tax goes up that column, but its real goal is to reduce the amount of emissions by the gap. What we do is we only focus on the gap, and so we're simply buying back emissions in that space. We're simply buying back the gap that you need, rather than taxing the whole of uh, the whole of the pyramid or the whole of the column of emissions and that's how it can be much cheaper and the cost per tonne of abatement um, will be what it is but uh, we've allowed $15 per tonne we actually assumed it would be 12 now uh, since we have done our uh, estimates and had lots of consultations the real cost we think is likely to be significantly lower and with what's occurring overseas that helps our system whereas it hurts um, the, the government's model because they have a massive revenue shortfall which is either going to mean they'll have to have another form of tax or they'll have to take away, um, take away some of the uh, social benefits. Um, so that's the, the difference there. 
Um, I think that's uh, all I need to say at the moment. The rest we'll deal with through questions. Thank you.